Hello, Grove family. My name is Nicole Robinson, and I'm one of the teachers in women's Bible study here at the Grove. I am so excited that you've decided to join us today. And speaking of joining us today, we'd like to know and connect with you. So if you'll take a moment, if this is your first time with us, and fill out our digital connect card. If you're watching with us live, please just click on the link at the top right. And if you're watching with us on YouTube, please just take a moment to look down in the description box and find the link there. But we would love to know who you are and how you came to join us. Our men are traveling to Belize in just a few months, and we have a fundraiser to support them on Friday, October 9th. It is our golf classic, so all of those golfers out there, this is for you. It features a golf scramble as well as a lunch. There's a putting contest that's happening at 8 a.m., and then at 9 a.m. is tea time. It's $150 per golfer, and you can register for this event at thegrove.cc slash register. And lastly, if you're in need of prayer today, we have prayer partners waiting and standing by to pray with you. So please just take a moment to take a look at the live chat, or you may also email us as well with your prayer requests. And now, will you please join us for some praise and worship? Well, welcome church. Um, Hebrews 10 tells us that Christ made a sacrifice once and for all for us. And by his death and resurrection, we're able to draw near to his throne no matter what we're walking through, no matter where our emotions are at today, we can draw near because of Jesus. Because of him, we can sing this out. We can raise our hallelujah. So church, let's do that together. In the midst of the mystery and all that we're walking through, let's sing and praise our good king. I'll raise your hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I'll raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I'll raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody
uncertain and ever, ever changing times. Would we stand firm in your truth and remember who you are? Cling to that, would that be our hope? Gathered, mended. 
Was born. 
broken things and broken people, God. And you invite us into your presence. God, somehow when we are unworthy, sometimes even when our hearts are cold, God, because of Jesus and his death and resurrection for us, we can draw near. We can be your children. We can come to you, God. And you are good. You're a good father and you see us and you love us and you make something beautiful out of our lives, God. So would you help us cling to that? Would you help us to trust your goodness, to trust your hand in our lives, God? We live for your glory. We love you. We wanna make your name known. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, worship team. I want to start off just by saying that I'm thankful for our county supervisors and being an advocate for local businesses and churches. That's what our local leaders are for, and I'm thankful for them. If you didn't hear, Riverside County is now in the red category, which means that churches can re-enter the building up to 25% capacity or 100 people is the limit. That's a blessing for smaller churches. It's still a challenge for larger churches, but I'm an optimist and I say it's a step in the right direction. So how will this affect the Grove? I'm sure you may want to know. I have some exciting news. On October 11th, we're gonna start offering children ministry inside the building. Ages newborn all the way up to sixth grade. Uh, Early Childhood Ministries, that's ECM, our kids department, and the bridge. They're going to be meeting in three different buildings. We can have 100 person people in each building, and we're going to have multiple services. I'll tell you more about that in a second. You will need to register your kids um, to show up, even with our outdoor service, if you've shown up. Just for an example, last week we had about 200 people register to go to the outside service. We had uh, about 1,000 people show up. Totally okay, but for the kids, you have to register, okay? You got to register. So I wanted you to know that. Now, I know that some of you, you felt more comfortable at home, and that's fine. Uh, We're not trying to pressure anyone. Um, I know some of you would have liked to come to the outdoor service. It's just easier for you to stay in your home. And the children's ministry has those great videos that you've been watching and having the services there. You've been waiting for us to give the option of having kids inside. Well, here it is. Hopefully you can join us now, October 11th. Now, because of the size of the Grove, we're gonna continue to do our outdoor services for the adults. Uh, We think that this is the best quality of service that we can offer. Offer instead of having a hundred people in each, in each room and stream it to five different rooms as you watch me on a screen and we have to mandate that you have to wear a mask. We know that everyone has a different opinion on masks. Where if we do it outside, continue to do the services outside, we can have more than a hundred people. We don't have to mandate you wearing masks because your social distance and you're outside. We just reco- recommend it. We think that's a better way. Wanted to let you know that we had almost a thousand people at our last outdoor service, which is fantastic. And we're guessing that more people are going to start to attend that service with the temperatures cooling up a little bit. And now that uh, kids can start attending inside for during the services. So we think there's a need for a second service. Instead of just having one service, we're going to offer two services starting October 11th. The time will be 9 a.m. and also 11 a.m. And that's going to start October 11th. Also, starting October 11th, we're going to have the chapel open for those who want to watch inside the church. In case the temperature is a little cool or you just want to be inside the church, we'll have the stream service available for you at those two times. Now, as I know as we enter into the fall, if this still continues, and, and the winter with, with these parameters the county has set up, um, there's a chance that we will have a cold wet day. What is the Grove going to do then? Well, I wanted to let you know, even when we we started revealing our different plans months ago, we always told you that this is a game plan and we may have to call an audible one weekend depending upon uh, the weather. So we hope that you'll follow us on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. We communicate through that often. If you're not a social media person, you can sign up for our weekly email um, just so that we can keep you updated if plans need to change. Also wanted to let you know that if you're looking to get involved in some type of ministry, we would love you to be a volunteer in our early childhood ministries, our kids department, or even the bridge. Uh, We know not all of our volunteers may be ready to come back. We've been told that uh, many of them are excited, but if you're looking for a way to serve, please contact uh, Amanda Peck. Her email address is right below here. Uh, Renee McAlexander or Sarah Bohannon, who's also a co-director for the bridge, and they can fill you in on how to get involved. Today, 
Today, we're going to continue our series of Jude, uh, Contending for the Faith. If you didn't get to listen to the first sermon last week, and I'd even encourage you to stop right now and go back and listen to me preach last week, and so you'll be get caught up, and, uh, and you'll be ready for, for this one, all right? Think of it as episode one, episode two. Maybe you're going to binge on sermons today, and you can watch two today, all right? Maybe you can't handle that. That's okay, too. Uh, but last week... Uh, Uh, We talked about Jude writing to those who are called, loved, and kept. um, And we see them asking that that God would bless them with mercy, peace, and love, that he would give it to them in abundance. And we see Jude, who is the brother of Jesus, really the half-brother of Jesus, full brother of James, encourage the church to contend for the faith to strive intensely for it, to preserve it, which has been handed down to us once and for all, that that is our greatest fight as Christians. And Jude informs the church in the later part of the verses that we studied that there have been some individuals who have crept into the church and they're perverting the grace of God, that they are not followers of Jesus Christ, that they don't view Jesus as sovereign, nor do they view him as Lord. So today we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 16. Now let me tell you, this is a strange portion of the book of Jude. And I I told you about this last weekend that we were going to be entering into this. Even when we put together the sermon series uh, a couple months ago, we broke it off into four sections like many commentators do. And we were excited about sermon number one, sermon number three, and sermon number four thinking, man, those passages, they're going to preach. However, sermon number two, which I'm talking on today, the text today, we thought, well, that's going to be a strange one to communicate. You know, God, what, what are you trying to say to us? Why did Jude include this in his book? What do you want us to learn? Now, I'm just going to say it. There are some strange things in the Bible. You ever read something in the Bible and you thought, that's, that's a little weird. I- I'm surprised that's in scripture. You may have wondered, why did God include that? I had one of these moments this week as I'm going through the book of Deuteronomy. I read Deuteronomy 25, 11 through 12. Um, we are not going to post that. I'm not even going to read it right now because it's just a little weird and maybe not appropriate for the whole family. But here's the thing. I sent it to Natalie because it, it's kind of like a command and a warning to wives. And I said, Nat, just want you to be cautious. Okay, read this passage. May it help you. I'm sure you're curious what it says. Go and read it yourself. Deuteronomy 25, 11 through 12. And all the wives out there be warned. This is in scripture. It's just interesting. The point being, sometimes you read something and you think, huh, I didn't know that that was in the Bible. So we're going to start off with a little game. It's a little game that's called, is it in the Bible? And I'm going to ask six questions, actually five questions and one bonus question. And you have to write true or false next to your notes or whoever you're talking to. You can even pause right now and decide what the winner gets. And you have to decide, is this in the Bible? Are you ready? All right, let's go. Question number one, a guy lives in the Bible for 1,000 years. Is it in the Bible? A guy who lives for almost 1,000 years, is it in the Bible? And you can't say Jesus, you can't say the Holy Spirit, God the Father. Okay, the answer is true. Yes, there is a man, Methuselah, 969 years old. He was the son of Enoch, the father of Lamech, and the grandfather of Noah. All right, Grandpa Methuselah, 969 years old old. Now, my friend Kyle Duke, he helped send me a lot of these facts. The guy just has a wealth of biblical knowledge. He even sent me this interesting stat here. If Methuselah was born the year of the founding of the United States of America, he would currently have 725 years left of his life before he died. I mean, can you imagine living that long? Would you want to live that long? My answer is no, unless my wife was living that long with me. Gotcha, babe. All right, so that's question number one. Maybe you have one point, maybe you don't. Question number two, a talking horse. Is that in the Bible? True or false? The answer, that's false. It's ridiculous. There's no talking horse in the Bible, but there is a talking donkey, okay? If you've never read that story, you need to check it out in Numbers 22, but no horse, that's ridiculous. There is a talking talking donkey though. Question number three, 40 plus youth killed tragically by two bears because they made fun of a bald guy. Is that in the Bible? Kind of random. Is that in the Bible? True or false? The answer is actually true. 
It's in 2 Kings chapter 2. And this is with Elisha. I guess Elisha was bald. Some youth were making fun of him. He calls down curses on them. And two female bears come out and tragically kill 40 youth. Now, I think the point of this passage is don't make fun of bald people. Bald is beautiful. And if you're bald, your new favorite person in the Bible might be Elisha. All right, question number four. A woman who rides a giraffe to Jerusalem seven days a week for 40 years while standing on her head. Is that in the Bible? Question, the answer is false. No, that's ridiculous. It's not there. I was hoping, though, the seven days and 40 years would catch you off guard since they're biblical numbers. All right, question number five. God tells the people to go number two outside the camp because he didn't want to see it. Is that in the Bible, true or false? The answer is actually true. That is in Deuteronomy 23, where God gives the people of Israel, actually Moses gives the people of Israel instructions on how they're supposed to relieve themselves, go outside the camp, grab a shovel, dig a hole, because God's in your camp and he doesn't want to see that stuff, nor smell it. Okay, last question, and it is a bonus question for you. A unicorn. Is a unicorn in the Bible? Answer, true. That's right. For those of you who believe in unicorns, that may have made your day. It's found in Daniel 8 verse 5. It says, as I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. A floating goat unicorn. Wow. Excellent. Who got all five right? And the bonus. By the way, the bonus is worth two points. Join us next week for another episode of is it in the Bible? Actually, we may have another game for you in a couple weeks. Christina Pendleton put it together. It's, did the Beatles say this or did God say this? It's another fun game possibly coming your way. Now, the point of this game, besides wanting to have some fun, is that the Bible has some interesting stuff. And at times it will make us think, why is it in there? I think that's the fun part of studying God's word. It's a great book. It's interesting. It's exciting. It's impactful. At times it's a little strange, but I believe that God has put everything in there for a purpose and a reason. Everything is inspired for a reason. Even what we're going to read today in Jude verses five through 16. And I have to tell you, I think this is one of the benefits of going through a book and preaching through everything that's there because I, as a pastor, I can't cherry pick. I mean, if it's up to me, I may be preaching Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 every single week. What a great passage of scripture. I would never choose this passage right here, but it's there for a reason. And I believe that when we give thought to why God put this there, we're going to discover something good. In fact, we see that in Proverbs 16, 20, it says, whoever gives thought to the word will discover good. So before we start reading this text, let's just pray and ask that the Lord would give us wisdom to discover the good that, we, that he wants us to see in this passage, which will help us live faithful lives and bring him the glory he deserves. You pray with me? Father God, we come before you. We love you. We want to bring you glory. And uh, I hope that even the little game we played brought a smile to your face. And we know that there's things that are funny in scripture. There's things that are a little strange. And I, I think there are some strange things in the passage that we're going to read today. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to discover the meaning, the goodness that's in it, and that it would change the way that we live. Help us to live faithful lives, be mindful of you, and to live for your glory. So, Lord, we just ask for your help and the power of your Holy Spirit to help us to see what you want us to see. We pray this in your name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn them to Jude, and we're going to look at verses 5 through 7 to begin. Here's what Jude says. It says, Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, I'm sure that you completely understand all that. We're just going to go through it just to make sure and uh, we'll go from there. So remember, 
in the beginning of this writing, Jude is talking to the church. Those who are called, those who are loved, those who are kept. And he's telling them to contend for the faith. That's the theme, the thesis of this passage. And yet there are people who have secretly crept in and perverting the grace of God. And now we get to verse 5. And Jude, he starts talking to them, the church, about God's judgment. That's what we see very clearly here. And Jude says this as he talks to the church. He says, though you already know all of this, of what I'm about to say in regards to God's judgment, I want to remind you of it. I want to remind you of God's judgment. And then Jude, he gives three historical examples of God's judgment for them to think about. Point number one on your notes, if you're taking notes, is this. Remember, God's judgment is a reality. I think that's what Jude wants the church to remember. God's judgment is a reality. He is going to judge the world and those who are disobedient. I believe it's as if Jude is telling the church, keep this in mind. In fact, that's why I've I've titled my sermon, Keep This in Mind. Keep these things in mind that God really does judge people, that his judgment is a reality. And then we start going through, we're going to start going through the, the three examples. Now, the first example of God's judgment that Jude brings to our attention is of Israel being destroyed and not believing in God. And that was found in verse five. Once again, verse five says, though you already know all this, I know you know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, I wanna point out that the NIV translates the word Lord. You see it there in scripture, it says Lord. Though you already knew all this, I wanna remind you that the Lord at one time delivered the people out of Egypt. Now that word Lord in the ESV, they actually translate it Jesus. And I like the translation of Jesus better because because it makes it clear that Jude is talking about Jesus and you see Jesus' involvement in the Old Testament. Jesus is not a New Testament figure that was born and that's only where we see him act. No, Jesus is God Almighty, Son of God, who was there in the Old Testament too. And we see that Jude is bringing to our attention that Jesus is the one who delivered people out of Egypt. He's also the one who destroyed those who did not believe. In fact, Paul talks about Jesus' involvement with uh, rescuing the people out of Egypt in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 4 and 9 where Jesus is described as the rock that they drank out of when they were thirsty in the wilderness. Now, was Jesus literally like the rock? No, but it's showing that Jesus was there. He is our rock. And he was providing for his people even back then. It wasn't just God the Father who delivered people out of Egypt. It was Jesus. Jesus who is our rock. Lord. And we are told in this passage, like I already said, that Jesus is the one who delivered his people out of Egypt, and it was him who later destroyed them who did not believe. Now, Jude, in writing this, he probably had in mind Numbers 14, where in number 14, you can see the people of Israel are coming closer to the promised land, and spies are sent out to the promised land to be there for 40 days to gather the goods of the land and to bring back a report of what they found. And these spies who come back, the spies belong to the Israelites, they came back and they brought a bad report saying, oh my goodness, the land is beautiful, but the people that are there, my goodness, they're going to destroy us. We cannot overtake them. And because of this, they were actually punished. Really, they were destroyed. Where for the 40 days that they were there, they would spend 40 years in the wilderness, One year for every single day that they did not believe that God could come through for them and they were destroyed. The only spies that brought back a good report were Caleb and Joshua. If your name is Caleb or Joshua, you're probably named after those two guys who had faith. And we see in this passage of scripture, Numbers 14, that really everyone who's above the age of 20, they're going to die off. They're not going to be able to enter the promised land, but... Those who believed Joshua, Caleb, and those who are younger who didn't have that chance to make their decisions yet of whether or not they're going to follow the Lord, believe in the Lord, well, they were able to enter into the promised land. So here's the thing. Jude starts with the story of Israel. It's not even chronological. If it was chronological, he would have started with the angels, but he didn't do that. He started with the story of Israel. Why? Well, many believe because that was God's people. He had favor on them. He saved them from Egyptian slavery. Those people saw God do some miraculous things, but then he judged them when they sinned and they did not believe. As if to say for us to remember, 
Judgment's a real thing. Keep this in mind. That Jude wants God's people to persevere to the end. In fact, we're going to see that theme next, next week. Dr. Ed Stetzer, um, who's a writer for Christianity Today, he also works um, at Wheaton College in Chicago. He's going to come and share and talk on this, that really contending for the faith, what that looks like is to persevere to the end. And that's what we're seeing here in this, that we would believe in the promises of God to the very end. That we would persevere. Now remember, Jude told the people that he was writing to, you, you are the called, you are the loved, you are the kept. God's going to keep you. You're not going to fall away. But he's also reminding us of God's judgment. And I think God's judgment in thinking about that, that's something that does keep us, that God uses so that we would be obedient to the Lord in all things. Joe Hobbs, he, Pastor Joe Hobbs at our church, he even wrote me an email. He says, you know, Daniel, I always wanted to please my earthly father growing up. But it, punishment, I mean, me being spanked, at times that, that would make me be obedient to him. And I think there's that aspect of fearing the Lord, understanding how powerful God is, knowing that he's going to judge us in the end. Well, that may even motivate us to be all the more obedient. But yes, there are people around the community of God that are not called, loved, and kept. And they're going to fall away. Even with the people of Israel after being delivered from Egypt. Yes, they were circumcised and they were considered members of Israel. But that was on the outside. It doesn't mean that they were circumcised in their heart. It didn't mean that they belonged to God. And that's something that we see throughout this passage. Those who are called, loved, and kept, they belong. And those who don't, who are just among the people, they will fall away. They will sin. And there were many people in the Old Testament that didn't belong. They didn't believe. And they were judged. Judgment is a reality. And then it goes on to the second example in verse 6, which even talks about the angels. Even the angels had some in their community that didn't belong to God, that weren't called, loved, and kept, but they fell away. And that's the example we see, verse 6. Let's look at that again. It says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness. It's a weird kind of word spin on the word kept that we keep seeing in Jude. They're now kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. And this is where things start to get just a little strange. Now, some think that this passage of scripture has to do with the original fall where the angels fell down from heaven because they didn't keep their position of authority that God had for them. That would include now what are now demons and also Satan himself, while others, and I would lean more towards this, they believe that this has to do with Genesis 6, 1 through 4. I'm not going to read this passage. You can go back and check it out. It's right before the flood, and it's about the angels coming down from heaven turning into humans and having sexual relations with beautiful women, which led them to having kids that turned out to be Nephilim, is what, how the Bible describes them, or giants, which then right after that in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it enters into the flood um, because of the sins of mankind and also the sins of the angels. Now, the sins that the angels committed, according to Jewish tradition, was that they didn't keep the position of authority that God had put them in, in their service to them. Instead, they changed their identity, they came down here, and they had sexual relations and were intimate with women. Like I said, it's a bizarre, strange story. You may not have even heard of that before. That's okay. Now, we're going to see, as we continue on in the story in verses 14 through 16, that Jude quotes a source in, the, in those verses called First Enoch. Now, First Enoch is not an inspired text. It's not a part of our, our canon. Um, but at the same time, there are some things in this book that must be true. And therefore, Jude, he quotes it. Now, also in this book, First Enoch, it talks a lot about the angels and their fall and their intimacy with women and all of that kind of stuff. So Jude, he obviously appears for this to be true. I mean, the first example with Israel was true. The next example, Sodom and Gomorrah is true. This one must be true as well. Now, some might ask this, well, can angels still come down, turn into humans and have relationships with, with human beings? I mean, that's a, that's a great pickup line if you're a human. Go up to someone and say, hey, are you, are you an angel? I mean, did Natalie come down here because she saw me and she just could not resist me? Why, well, I hope that's not the case. I don't want her to be a fallen angel. I don't think that's true at all. Is this still 
possible. I mean, could you be married to a disobedient angel? No, I don't think so. Thomas Schreiner, commentator, says this. I think the point of the imprisonment of angels and the flood narrative is that God now hinders any such unions from taking place. All this to say, the reason why this is in here, in this passage of scripture, is that God punishes those who disobey, even his angels, and that there were even some angels in their midst that did not truly belong to God. Sin overtook them. And sin is a powerful thing. Sin will definitely overtake those who do not have a relationship with the Lord. It will, it will make them fall. Charles Spurgeon says this, If sin could drag an angel from the skies, it may well pluck a minister from the pulpit, a deacon from the communion table, a church member out of the midst of his brothers and sisters. It's only perseverance and holiness, which is the token of eternal salvation. Which is true. I mean, the... the the perseverance and holiness is what shows that we're saved. The fact that God calls us, loves us, and keeps us proves that we belong to him. It proves that there is, is fruit in our life. So, so here's the thing. If you're, if you're following, falling away from the Lord, if, if you're doing that over and over again, you're not persevering in your faith, I think you have to ask yourself, are you saved? Do you understand the gospel? Do you belong to him? We'll talk about that more in a second. Now, next thing, the third example that Jude gives is found in verse seven. It says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Now, commentators bring out the fact that Jude says, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah surrounding the towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality, which also kind of strengthens the point of the angels, because that was talking about a sexual immorality stuff that was going on there. So we see Sodom and Gomorrah and what they did and how they didn't follow God. They were sexually immoral. And because of that, my goodness, they serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. That hell is a real place that people are going to go to. Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of that. It brings our attention to God's judgment. All that to say, God, Jude, is telling God's people, God's judgment is a reality. It's going to happen. And those who do not obey the Lord will be judged. So for us, the application is, do you know the Lord? Do you know him? I mean, do you really know him? Do you understand the gospel that God created the world and it was good? That, that, that sin entered the world through mankind. And that because of sin, we cannot have a relationship with God the Father. But God the Father loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus who is the son of God, who is fully God and fully man, who died on the cross for our sins. And he rose again, proving his deity. And that it's only by having faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us that you will be saved. And it's when you call upon the name of the Lord and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he's sovereign, that he's Lord, that you give your life to him, that you're saved. Because there's many people who are not saved. There are many people who just hang out with the community of believers. They interact with them. They may see God do some cool things, but they haven't been changed. So maybe you need to give your life to the Lord right now. Maybe the Lord brought you to watch this so you can repent of your sins and believe in him. That's been my prayer that many people would be saved this weekend. Even one, just be saved. Now, here's the thing. After giving these examples, these three examples on God's judgment being a reality, Jude goes back to the individuals who have crept into the church and are perverting the grace of God. Let's go to verses 8 and 10. Verse 8 and 10, Jude says, In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, they reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander whatever they do not understand. And the very things they do understand by instinct as irrational animals do will destroy them. We'll stop right there. More interesting stuff. So we see here these intruders in the church are deserving of God's judgment. Why? Well, what Jude points out is because they have relied upon their dreams 
as the authority instead of the word of God. Somehow, whatever these dreams are, they're pushing them to do things that are wrong and they're claiming that their dreams are the basis for their immoral actions, starting with the fact that they're polluting their bodies, then rejecting authority, and also they're heaping, heaping abuse on celestial beings, meaning like they're talking trash on angels, which is kind of a weird thing. We'll talk about that in a, little, in a second. The first problem, though, is it says that they polluted their bodies they polluted their bodies. Somehow their dreams were causing them to pollute their bodies. Another way of saying this is they were defiling their flesh, which often designates sexual sin. So commentators will say that these intruders are using their dreams saying, okay, it's justifying my sexual freedoms and my actions because I had this dream. This is what led me to do this. And then not only that, but they also reject God's authority. God says one thing, their dream said another thing, I'm going with my dream. And then it says that they also slandered angels, which seems unusual, maybe even comical. I don't know if that sounds funny or not, but they were talking trash on angels. And, and we don't know why. Why were they talking bad about angels? Maybe it's because of the sins of the angels in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Maybe because they knew that as believers, we're going to judge angels at the very end and they were boasting about just how much more powerful they are, which just seems ridiculous in itself. But here's the thing, they, they were wrong in making these judgments and that was not their responsibility. So Jude gives this example even of the archangel Michael not pronouncing judgment on, on the devil himself and gives this example of struggling with the devil about Moses' body. Now, we don't know why Michael and the devil were disputing over Moses' body. One author says that maybe the devil was trying to claim authority over Moses' body because Moses is sin in killing the Egyptian. I mean, maybe there was some type of spiritual battle going on and redeeming this aspect of it. So there was a dispute. It was, there was a dispute. Now, this fight is found nowhere in scripture. Whatever Jude is referring to, it's been, it's been lost. We, 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 have, we have no proof of it. It possibly came from a lost section of work called the Testament of Moses, as one author says. Now, this doesn't mean that Jude thought that this uh, portion of scripture, or not scripture, but this, this writing of the Testament of Moses was inspired. I mean, other New Testament writers, they, they constantly quote things that are outside of the Bible, not constantly, but a couple times, of just saying, yeah, that, that part was true. Paul does this a couple times in Acts 17, 28. I mean, he quotes their own poets. He talks about their poets. Another time you see Paul do this in Titus 1.12. He actually quotes uh, their own uh, prophets, the Cretes, and pointing out something that they said that was true. So it's not unusual for an author in scripture to, to use another source while not saying that whole source is true, but say, yeah, that one aspect of it was true. And Jude makes the point that even with the devil, how evil and ridiculous the devil is, the archangel Michael does not pronounce judgment on him, but instead Michael says, the Lord rebuke you. That Michael did not condemn the devil, but he left that to God's authority. And that what you see in this passage of scripture is you're really seeing the authority of God, that it's his authority to judge. So point number two in your notes, judgment and authority belongs to the Lord. I mean, these people who had crept into the church that Jude is talking about, they didn't acknowledge the authority of God. They didn't see him as sovereign. They didn't see him as Lord. They didn't follow his word. Instead, they followed their dreams. They were the authority. They made their own judgments. They even were so ridiculous to judge angels, maybe on something that they fully didn't understand, as these verses said, and so they slandered them. Maybe they weren't meant to know what was really going on here. But here's the thing that Jude points out. These people, they were like irrational animals that follow their own bodily instincts and their emotions that they didn't acknowledge Jesus as sovereign and Lord. They didn't acknowledge Jesus Christ as having all the authority and they acted like they had all the authority. That was the problem with these intruders. So an appropriate question for us to ask ourselves is this. Who's the authority in your life? Is God Almighty, his son, Jesus Christ, is he your authority? Do you live by his word? Do you follow him? 
Do you say and do things that only he wants you to do? Is he your authority? Or are you governed by your own feelings and desires like animals? Just like Jude points out. That's the comparison there. Or by God and his word. Are you one of those who judges everything? Or do you look to the Lord? Is he the ultimate judge? Man, may Jesus always be our Lord and authority in everything. May he drive us in what we do. All right, let's remind ourselves now. It's good to take a little break of that proverb I quoted in the very beginning. He who gives thought to the word will discover good. How are we doing so far? All right, we're doing our best in this chapter so far. Lord, teach us. Let's continue on. Jude, verse 11 through 13. In Jude 11 through 13, Jude says, Woe to them, these intruders. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed the prophet into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars from whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. That judgment is imminent. That judgment is coming. We'll stop right there. Now, have you noticed that, ju that Jude, almost said judge, uh, Jude, he loves giving the examples in groups of three. He does it all throughout this letter, talking about, you know, Israel and the angels being judged, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, he does this all throughout the letter. Now he compares these intruders to three other examples. He, he, he compares them to Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Now, I, can't, I don't have time to go through each person. Briefly, Cain's the one who killed his brother Abel. We have Balaam. He's the one who was not nice to the donkey that spoke. All right, remember we talked about that? Somehow I brought that quiz back in. But he, he was somehow enticed by a king for greedy gain to really curse the people of Israel. Fascinating story. Then you also have Korah, who Korah, he kind of rebelled up against the leadership of Israel and the earth opened up and swallowed him and his entire family. Another fascinating story. I'm not going to break down each person anymore, but here's the thing. All three of these people right here were not satisfied in their place with God. So here's what they did. They rebelled against God, seeking gain for themselves at any cost. And in all three of those stories, you can see that they are each judged. And the main idea, I think here, is we're looking at the motivation of these intruders and asking ourselves, okay, what's my motivation? I mean, the motivation of these three examples here was greed. They, they were all about themselves. And so it seems to appear that this is the same thing with the people that Jude was talking about in these passages. In verses 12 and 13, Jude calls these people blemishes. If you're studying through the ESV, it calls them hidden reefs. I actually like that better, hidden reefs. The idea of, of these reefs, you know, you go to Hawaii, there's reef in the water, they're hidden, and then ships are gonna come and be completely destroyed by them, saying these intruders, these false teachers, they are hidden reefs, they are blemishes. Be cautious of them. Be aware of them. That these people, guess what? They were at your love feasts which possibly he's talking about the Lord's Supper, that they were among you. And it didn't seem like anything was wrong. But here's the thing. These people were greedy for themselves. They were looking after themselves and their guidance could mislead you. They are shepherds who feed themselves, not looking after the best interests of the flock, but looking after their own best interests, that they have no concern. These false teachers, these intruders, except for themselves. And here's the thing. These teachers, these false intruders, they promised much, but they delivered little. And that's where you see the example of like, they're the clouds without rain. All right, big promises, no, nothing being produced from it or trees without fruit. And here's the thing. Jude wants us to see that these people were not godly, but they were selfish. So once again, what does the Lord want us to take away from this? What can we take away from this? I, I think... Part of it is that there's a caution and there's a discernment that we need to have in learning from others in the church. That although God is the judge, we don't judge others. We need to be wise and discern, okay, is this, is this leading towards God's glory? What is true? What is false teaching? 
I mean, there's even a show, I believe on Netflix, called The American Gospel that talks about even preachers in this way that kind of distort the truth after their own gain and make people believe a lie, which really it's just for their own good. So that's the thing. What's the fruit that comes from the ministry? Is it just for them or is it for God's glory? I think that's something we have to have in mind. Now, you go to the Grove. I believe that you trust me and our pastoral team. I hope you do. I have the fear of the Lord in me where I want to do only what he calls me to do. But wherever you're at, maybe you're going to move one day, whatever happens, be cautious. That's why these things are in scripture. At the same time, I think that we also have to question our own motivations. Okay, what motivates me to do what I do? What motivates me to say the things that I say? Point number three in your notes, what motivates your decision-making? Is there some level of greed in your life which causes you to do things just for yourself? I gotta tell you, I think that's the truth for all of us. I think there's many times we do things just because it benefits us and it doesn't benefit our neighbor or our spouse or family member, our kids, our our roommates, another person in the church. Always come back to like, okay, Lord, what's in my heart? Like reveal what's in my heart. Purify my heart. That's something I pray every week. God, purify my heart. Show me, Lord. Show me. You say that you test my heart. Bring out the wickedness in it. Help me to do things only for you and not for myself. We should always be questioning our motivations. Are we contending for the faith and for God's glory or are we contending for ourselves? Now let's finish with Jude 14 through 16. We'll sum this up. Jude 14 and 16, Jude says, Enoch, there he is, he's quoting Enoch, the seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them, all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires and they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. It's about their own advantage. So here we see that Jude quotes first Enoch. I believe it's chapter one, verse nine is what I read. Now, here's the thing. Once again, it does not mean that Jude thought that Enoch, this book was inspired. But in this instance, he takes out a piece of truth that was there and says, yes, this is going to happen. That of course, God's gonna come back with thousands of angels. He's going to judge the, earth and all of those who are ungodly. And once again, he begins to talk about these ungodly people and characteristics that they have, that they're grumblers, that they are fault finders, looking for things that are wrong, that they just follow their own evil desires, that they boast about themselves, that they're in it for themselves and not for the glory of God. Now that has to be a warning for us all. Whether you're a pastor, a teacher, a small group leader, a volunteer leader, we all have some level of influence. But Grove family, may we not be grumblers. May we not be fault finders looking for issues. May we not be motivated by something selfish, looking for just a gain for ourselves. But may we contend for the faith always to bring God glory. And I think that's the idea that we see here. May our teaching be healthy, healthy words that always points other people to Jesus. I'm going to point you to Jesus. I'm going to point you to Jesus. I'm going to point you to his glory. I'm going to point you to things that are true, not things that are false, things that are true. I think that's the point. These false teachers pursued selfish gain, seeking desires for what was best for them in their situation, their life, and not necessarily what was best for God's kingdom and his glory. They weren't looking to strengthen others. They wanted to strengthen themselves. Even the people of Israel, going back in history, they were discontent with God providing for them for 40 years. God gave them everything they needed while they're in the wilderness, but they grumbled. They complained. They were really fault finders, giving Moses a hard time. And and here's the thing, they didn't enter the promised land. Not even Moses, because he grumbled too. God gave them all they needed, but their words got them in trouble. So here's the thing, our pursuit, please God. Our pursuit, please God. Bring him glory and judgment will come to those who are ungodly. Point number four in your notes. The judgment of God is coming. The judgment of God is coming. May we feel that. May we know that. May we think about that. May that motivate us. May we keep this in our mind. That God's judgment is serious every day. How we live, how we act, what we communicate, what we say, how we build up the church to bring God glory. We will be judged. And most importantly, we'll be judged for what you believe about God. 
Do you believe in him? Do you love him? Do you know him? Whenever it talks about judgment, I think with God's judgment should follow repentance. For a Christian in the church, if there's things that you need to repent of and say, you know what, God, I haven't been following you faithfully. I haven't been doing this the way that you've called me to. Lord, I repent. I want to persevere. I know you called me. I know you love me. I know you kept me. I want to walk in obedience. And for those that are not following Jesus, you're not a follower of Christ. Maybe you're just amongst the community. Maybe the Lord, by the power of his Holy Spirit, is going to use this passage to show you, you know what? You kind of know of God, but you don't know him. You don't belong to him. And I already shared the gospel with you earlier, but here's the thing. Scripture says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Give your life to the Lord today. Say, God, I want to belong to you. I I want to follow you. I give you everything. And because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for our sins, he's taken that punishment for our sins. He's taken the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not going to fall on those who have not called on his name. Excuse me. The wrath of God is going to fall on those who did not call on his name, but it's not going to fall on those who have called on his name, who are saved. Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself. So may the judgment of God, even the talk of the judgment of God, may it move us to be faithful, to continue to be faithful, to contend for the faith with the purpose of bringing God the glory that he deserves. By the power of almighty God, I pray that his Holy Spirit has used something in the passage just to strengthen you, to want to contend for the faith and to bring God the glory that he deserves. God bless you, Grove family.
Thank you so much, worship team. Please remember, if this is your first time joining us or if you decided to follow Jesus, please take the time to fill out a digital connect card. If you need prayer, please take the time to email us or call us or still participate in the live chat as well. And then lastly, we appreciate all of your generosity, especially during these times. And remember that there are four ways for you to give here at The Grove. We wanna thank you again for attending service with us and please have a blessed week.